Welcome to my presentation titled Among the Eternal Snows, Edwin James and the First Recorded Ascent of Pikes Peak, July 13th through 15th, 1820. My name is Phil Carson. Thanks for joining. As you know, Pikes Peak is one of the most prominent mountains along the Front Range. It's visible from as much as 100 miles away. Indigenous peoples lived in this region for at least 12,000 years prior to Euro-Americans. And these indigenous peoples utilized the natural resources from the prairies to the peaks, as well as having a natural affinity, a spiritual connection with this particular mountain. Although I'm not aware of any prehistoric artifacts found on the summit of Pikes Peak, it is certain that indigenous peoples over 12 millennia repeatedly visited the summit. Indigenous peoples known to us historically, including the Ute, Pawnee, Kiowa, Arapaho, and Apache, among others, all recount centuries of spiritual connection with the mountain that we call Pikes Peak. The upcoming issue of the Colorado Magazine, formerly known as Colorado Heritage, from our colleagues at History Colorado, will feature testimony on this point by Ute spokespeople, accompanied by a version of the story I present here. That underscores that our subject today is merely the first recorded ascent of this mountain. As we'll see, however, the actual climb is less important than understanding that the long expedition of 1820 represented the first instance in which American scientists investigated the Rocky Mountains and recorded, analyzed, and reported what they found. This map was drawn in 1779 by Miera y Pacheco after New Mexico's Governor Anza defeated a Comanche band that had plagued New Mexico in the late 18th century. In the upper right, just to the left of the word Norte, which you can see here, is a mountain range that the Spaniards called the Sierra del Almagre, today's Pikes Peak Massif. Spaniards had been frequenting the Pikes Peak region for exploration, trade, diplomacy, and war for two centuries, since founding in 1598. So, centuries before the American Revolution, Spaniards were already familiar with this mountain. I find it unlikely that colonial Spaniards climbed it. They typically had more practical goals. After the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, Spain and the United States would argue for nearly two decades over what constituted the border between New Mexico and Louisiana Territory. Fast forward to 1820 and Major Stephen Long's expedition to the Rockies. This took place at a time when the Arkansas River informally served as the boundary between Spain's claims and those of the U.S., but the nature and whereabouts of the Arkansas River's headwaters would be relevant to the two countries' negotiations over a well-defined border. In 1820, Long was 35 years old, a Dartmouth graduate, a West Point instructor, and a member of the elite U.S. Corps of Topographical Engineers. Then Secretary of War John Calhoun ordered Long to make a reconnaissance of the headwaters of the Platte and Arkansas rivers. Ostensibly for science, probably to inform the negotiations with Spain, but also to assess the region's economic potential, as well as to counter British, French, and Spanish trading influence among the region's indigenous peoples. Long had already convinced Calhoun and others that scientists should accompany government expeditions to the West. Most agreed that artists should go as well, because a visual record would resonate with the public and might garner support for a young nation's westward expansion. So, scientists and artists accompanied Long and a handful of soldiers as this tiny expedition of 20 men ascended the Platte River from the Missouri frontier in June 1820. Long was literally not a happy camper. He had been promised support in terms of men and money, but received neither by the time he departed for the Rockies. Only six soldiers could be mustered from frontier posts to accompany the expedition. Long paid out of pocket for the expedition's supplies, expecting to be reimbursed at expedition's end. In 
As an ambitious man, Long probably resented these circumstances, but he had orders. So he decided he would make short work of his expedition. Say hello to our story's protagonist, Edwin James. In 1820, an impetuous 22-year-old botanist and geologist, a graduate of Vermont's Middlebury College, and a protege of the great contemporary naturalists John Torrey and Amos Eaton. If accurate, this portrait is amazing in that James's expression conveys much of what we know of his personality, intelligent, ambitious, confident, even cocky. Tory and Eaton recommended to Long that he hire James, who was desperately seeking a job, and Long did so. The two men met in Philadelphia in March 1820, and James wrote a personal letter to his brother John in Albany, New York, about his first impressions of Long. March 16th, 1820, Philadelphia. I find Long has the appearance of a pretty clever fellow, and as I judge of moderate talents. I believe he has formed a pretty good opinion of me, as to be sure he ought to do. Well, a window onto James's attitude, if you will. First, he delivers a compliment, but can't resist coupling it with a condescending remark. And he follows it up with smug self-congratulations. Unfortunately, it reminds me of what a know-it-all I was at age 22. In another letter to his brother, as he approached the frontier on May 10th, James wrote, if you will look at Mellish's map, you will see laid down, not far from the source of the Arkansas, a peak which is thought to be the highest in the neighborhood. It is our intention to climb this or whatever, to ascend this or whatever other mountain we may find to be the highest. James here refers to John Mellish whose 1816 map of America was the best available at the time. And James introduces a mystery here when he states that, quote, it is our intention to ascend this mountain. It appears that James looked at Mellish's map, which Long had along with him, and saw the peak dramatically depicted and suggested a mountain climb to Long. The question is, did Long share James's enthusiasm? We know Long had plans to measure Pike's highest peak, but did he give a hoot about climbing it? Subsequent events seem to answer the question. Now, this is a photograph of a page of James's unpublished diary, which resides at Columbia University in New York City. And it is one of two sets of documents that I used to put together this story. The other are James's letters to his brother quoted throughout this talk, which reside at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. So you see here that James had legible and disciplined handwriting. However, I can tell you that a full and accurate transcription had to take into account many odd spellings, sometimes baffling early 19th century syntax, all sprinkled with archaic botanical and geological terminology. but it was fun. This is Mellish's 1816 map of the United States of America. Note that the states end at the curving north-south green line just to the right of center that represents the Mississippi River. West of the Mississippi stretched a vast territory inhabited by hundreds of indigenous nations, even while the US, Spain, and Britain contested who thought they would exercise hegemony over it. Now in the upper left corner, not the corner, the upper left portion of the screen, you see a outrageously prominent mountain called the Pious Peak. And I just switched screens forward to Pike's 1810 map, which Mellish copied for his 1816 map. And here you see Pike's exaggerated depiction of the highest peak that he tried and failed to climb in November 1806. In another 
letter from James to his brother John in Albany on June 5th, 1820, the day before departing for the Rockies at Engineer Cantonment, an encampment uh, on the Miss Missouri River near the Platte Mouth. Quote, we shall make the greatest possible dispatch for our commanding officer is in the utmost anxiety to return. We shall, I fear, be at Cape Girardeau as early as the 1st of October. Well, James has just learned that Long intends to make short work of his journey to the Rocky Mountains and back. James had naively believed that the expedition, expedition would take many months, if not years, to explore the Platte and Arkansas headwaters. Long had his own reasons. For one, this poorly funded bare bones expedition did not seem likely to advance his career. Also, as leader, he had responsibility for 20 lives, including his own. And I think he understood that the tiny expedition would be vulnerable to attack on the high plains. And he was right. But when he revealed to James that the expedition was gonna be concluded as speedily as possible, a seed of conflict was planted. Let's have a look at Long's route superimposed over the contemporary territories. Uh, top right, the orange area, Missouri territory, the lower right, purple area, Arkansas territory, and to the west of both of them, the vague uh, claims for New Spain, uh, in other words, in this area, New Mexico. You can see that the long expedition began near the mouth of the Platte and the Missouri River, June 6th at Engineer Cantonment, ascended the Platte River within sight of Long's Peak, descended the Front Range to Pike's highest peak, and then made its way to the Arkansas River, where, as planned, the expedition split into two, one group descending the Arkansas, the second group led by Long, looking for the Red River of Texas, but descending the Canadian River by accident. This is the same route superimposed over our modern day states. So if you follow the same route of the expedition, you see that uh, it began at the eastern border of Nebraska, ascended the Platte to enter Colorado, descend the Front Range, reach the Arkansas, and one group descending the Arkansas through present day Kansas and Oklahoma, the other descending the Canadian River through the Texas Panhandle and Oklahoma, both to reunite at Fort Smith in September. This is a Samuel Seymour painting of Long's Castle with the Pawnee Nations. Samuel Seymour was one of two artists along on the expedition. Ascending the Platte, Long met with three different groups of the Pawnee Nation and gave them the usual spiel about the Great White Father in Washington and how he, Long, came in peace and friendship. For their part, the Pawnee were more honest. They warned Long that rival Plains warriors would decimate his puny expedition, and that this did not happen is surely due to pure luck or restraint. Ascending the Platte, the expedition encountered massive buffalo herds, a sight they'd never seen, herds of wild horses, diamondback rattlesnakes, staggering storms, and blistering sun. As they made their way each day, the scientists and artists kept busy documenting their surroundings. Having reached the front range after several weeks of riding, the men turned south for Pike's Peak, and in a shady patch near today's Air Force Academy, James encountered a plant he'd never seen before. It would become known as Aquilegia cerulea James, the blue columbine, which became Colorado's state flower in 1899. This is the very specimen that James collected 200 years ago, 
which is now housed with most of his long expedition collections at the New York Botanical Garden. After six weeks of hard riding, the expedition reached the vicinity of Pikes Peak. On July 12th, James made this entry into his diary. Quote, we are now in sight and within one day's ride of the peak, which is to be the ultimum of our excursions in the Northern Andes. It is certainly to be regretted that a longer time has not allowed us to examine and admire these glorious palaces of nature, but so it is, and so let it be. Well, diplomatic language, and let me explain that James's diary officially belonged to the government, and Long could demand to inspect it at any time. Thus, James maintained diplomatic language in his expedition diary. It was in his private letters to his brother that he uncorked his real feelings. And we have an example of this in a post-expedition letter that addresses this moment, July 12th, as Long camps on Fountain Creek, just a little southeast, well, 24 miles southeast of the base of Pikes Peak. James wrote, quote, Our scientific and enthusiastic commander encamped on a plain of sand at the distance of 24 miles from the base of the mountains and informed me that he allowed me three days to make what examination I wished among them. I remonstrated, requesting a longer time, but no more could be allowed me. Well, here James unleashes his criticisms of Long in a private letter. And here's the direct evidence that the seed of conflict had finally bloomed out in the open. Imagine, if you will, a young civilian naturalist, however ambitious and energetic, remonstrating, basically arguing with his commanding officer in front of the rest of the expedition. Long stood his ground. On July 13, 1820, Long and his men camped on Fountain Creek while James and others rode for the base of Pikes Peak. It is probably a perspective from Fountain Creek that Samuel Senior made a sketch of this scene, painting it later. We get a pretty, pretty realistic view of the snow-dappled summit at center, the foothills and prairie, a cloudburst in just part of the sky and a cottonwood on the left all pretty realistic perspectives from the arid front range. But the foliage on the right is too lush, and I suspect it's a post-expedition embellishment that uh, Samuel Seymour added after the fact. So it was that afternoon on July 13th that James and two other men reached the Manitou Springs, and based on a suggestion from the expedition's guide, Joseph Bijou, started up Ruxton Creek through Engelman Canyon. Having ridden 24 miles to reach the base of the mountain, it was three o'clock in the afternoon when the trio began climbing. They might have made three or four miles up Ruxton Creek when darkness forced them to camp. Here's a bird's eye view of Ruxton Creek in Engelman Canyon. You see the uh, twin tracks of the Cog Railway, and the tan material is Pikes Peak granite. And at this elevation, the Pikes Peak granite breaks into golf ball, the tennis ball size chunks, and makes hiking on it extremely difficult. For James and his companions, it was a hard uphill slog through the stream bed, around boulders, down timber, and on this sliding granite material. In my own several bushwhacks up the mountain, I had the benefit of stepping from railroad tie to railroad tie and making much better time. Well, July 14th, the next morning, in his diary, James wrote, quote, This morning we set off at an early hour, hoping to arrive on the summit by noon. After walking about half a mile over the same rugged and difficult road as yesterday, we passed a ravine discharging into the small stream which we had been ascending, and following the dividing ridge between two branches of this, we found the way much less difficult and dangerous. 
Obviously, James continues to underestimate his challenge, thinking perhaps they'll make the summit by lunchtime. And here is the key clue to his route on the mountain, which can be interpreted differently. He describes passing a ravine, which we usually think of as going past, but in early 19th century writing, passing a ravine also might mean threading it. So I think that there's a couple of possible routes on the mountain, and uh, one that I followed myself, which seemed to be the most direct, was the ridge between Sheep Creek and Lion Creek at Ruxton Park. But I've concluded both that various interpretations are possible, I reserve the right to change my mind on the route, but also the meager clues are too vague to be certain. So he's left, of, left, us, left us a little mystery to ponder. If you depart Ruxton Creek between Sheep and Lion Creek, there's a quite a challenging elevation chocked with boulders and deep forest that you've got a thread to reach the crater, which is pictured here, a small pond at the heart of the crater, the feature at the southeast base of the summit uh, that you'll find on many maps. Uh, and here the granite changes from small tennis ball chunks to larger chunks from, you know, microwave to uh, Volkswagen Beetle sized chunks and James mentions that change in his diary. The other key piece of evidence for James's basic route on the mountain is that above the crater as one climbs southwest to the mountain's southeast shoulder now known as Satchet Mountain a large swath of alpine wildflowers appear as you can see here. James wrote in his diary at this point Quote, soon after the entire disappearing of the timber commences a region of astonishing beauty and of great interest to a botanist. The area is closely covered with a thick carpet of short but brilliantly flowering plants. Looking back down at that field of wildflowers, we see a hiker in red in the left foreground for scale. Below and behind him, the pond at the base of the crater. And above that, in the background center, you can vaguely see Ruxton Creek about to be enshrouded in encroaching clouds. To his credit, despite the rigors of the climb, James spent a significant amount of time gathering species of previously unknown alpine wildflowers in this area and pressed them between the pages of his diary. He reported finding about 30 species. I know that he pressed these flowers between the pages of his diary because when I examined the diary in person, I could still see the impressions of the flowers that he had pressed between its pages and a little Pikes Peak dirt remains in the binding after 200 years. Well, let's just look at a few flowers that James recorded finding. Here nestled together are yellow alpine avens and blue sky pilot. I would like to thank now the Denver Botanical Gardens for providing me with uh, assistance in identifying these wildflowers that I merely photographed but did not pick. This is Alpine Yellow Paintbrush, another of James's finds. I didn't place anything in the photograph or scale, but uh, most of these flowers, including this one, are about the size of your pinky finger. And so you've got to lay down to get a close-up shot, and at 12,000 feet, laying down was a welcome respite from the climb. This is Alpine Primrose. A lovely bloom nestled between chunks of lichen modeled Pikes Peak granite. And a fourth specimen 
moss campion clinging to some soil on a half-buried boulder. Well, after making the most of my time laying down, shooting pictures, it was back to the climb. James wrote in his diary, we resumed our toilsome march and proceed slowly towards the summit. I found it impossible to go forward rapidly as my attention was constantly occupied by the appearance of new plants. At this point, James's route again parallels today's cog railway tracks. And as most of you probably know, some days you get lucky and you can climb a 14er and finish the job in perfect weather. However, on other days and on another climb, it was not to be so and we enjoyed thick fog and lightning and thunder as we made our way up the tracks to the summit. And on a day like this, it was good to have the tracks as a guide so as not to get lost in the clouds or step off the edge. Well, James reported achieving the summit around 4 p.m. and this would be his approximate view. At the center left, you can see the crater and how it acquired its uh, name with the pond it sent at the base. Just below that in the photograph are the switchbacks of the bar trail. And to the right of the pond in the crater, you see the massive fields of green grass that contain the fields of wildflowers that James uh, reported on and made his many discoveries on. James wrote in his diary of this moment, quote, with an infinitude of exertion and toil, I arrived at the summit of what has been considered the highest peak in this part of the range. The snow extended, according to my estimate, 1,500 feet down from the summit. This peak had among the French hunters and among the Indians the, reputi the reputation of being inaccessible. A year or two later, in the expedition's published report, James offered more details on his summit perspective. He wrote, quote, The view towards the north, west, and southwest is diversified with innumerable mountains, all white with snow. Immediately under our feet on the west lay the narrow valley of the Arkansas, which we could trace running towards the northwest. On the north side of the peak stretched a woodless and apparently fertile valley which must undoubtedly contain a considerable branch of the Platte River. To the east lay the Great Plains, rising as they receded until in the distant horizon they appeared to mingle with the sky. Now, this passage is important because by climbing Pike's Peak, not only did James do groundbreaking botanical work, but he was also able to provide Long with crucial information on the nature of the Platte and Arkansas headwaters. In his speed to conclude his expedition, Long declined to seriously explore either river as he rushed his expedition along. Clearly, by making these observations on the Platte and Arkansas headwaters, James also saved Long's hide by fulfilling his orders. And both James and Long knew it. Here's a composite photograph that shows an approximation of James's route. Note that in the center where the crater is indicated, the actual route between Ruxton Creek and the fields of wildflowers to the right is obscured both because of the perspective from the summit uh, as well as the fact that between Ruxton Creek and Satchet Mountain the route remains speculative. I've been called to my attention in the, that in the upper right what I've labeled Big Tooth Reservoir is actually Moraine Lake, um, a natural lake that was expanded by the city as a reservoir. After James and his companions descended, they slept once on the mountain and the next day, July 15th, uh, 
They rode back to Fountain Creek to Long's camp. The morning of July 16th at daybreak, Long pushed his men south to the Arkansas, where they spent two days ascending the Arkansas enough to be stymied by Royal Gorge, but with no serious effort made to um, circumvent that obstacle to explore the headwaters of the Arkansas. They broke the expedition in two. One group led by Captain Bell descended the Arkansas and Long and James headed south in search of the Red River of Texas, but mistakenly descended the Canadian River and the two parties reunited at Fort Smith in Arkansas Territory on September 13th, uh, just over three months after the start. On the descent to settled country, all suffered from heat, a lack of food and water, and many, including James, apparently contracted malaria or a similar disease from mosquitoes and ticks along the way. We'll return to James's letter home to his brother, written on October 26th from Cape Girardeau, Arkansas Territory. Quote, I am full of complaining and bitterness against Major Long on account of the manner in which he has conducted the expedition. And if I cannot rail against them, I can say nothing. We have traveled near 2,000 miles through an unexplored and highly interesting country and have returned almost as much strangers to it as before. Well, gripped by fever and pain, James is in a howling mood, and despite having performed amazingly productive work along with his scientific colleagues, James was still angered by the expedition's pace, which precluded better results. Now, a grain of salt, uh, James returned with 700 botanical specimens uh, in a horseback ride of 2,000 miles in three months. An incredible feat, quite frankly. However, he knew that Long had basically avoided fulfilling his orders to explore the headwaters of the Platte in Arkansas and had rushed the expedition along, which precluded James from exploring the botanical and geological aspects of the country. So he's still angry. However, in the same letter, James turns to bragging of his exploits. Quote, I have, however, seen many strange things. I have, moreover, seen the Rocky Mountains and shivered among their eternal snows in July, which every man has not done. I have also gone hungry for a long time eaten tainted horse flesh, owls, hawks, prairie dogs, and many other uncleanly things. So, I always love the reference to shivering among the eternal snows in July. Obviously, in 1820, a heavy summer snowstorm had coated the peak and the nearby foothills. However, today the eternal snows is a phrase that rings hollow as climate change is typically leaves Pikes Peak bereft of snow in summer. Even a seemingly permanent snowbank that used to exist just uh, below and southeast of the summit has been gone for as many as two decades. I'd like to conclude our talk with a look at words written by James's niece after his death in 1861. Quote, he was, a, he was an eminent scholar, a radical abolitionist and reformer of great moral rectitude and unflinching courage. He kept a pair of matchless horses of great speed and spirit with which many a poor fugitive slave was carried over the border of his state. And that would be Iowa, where James spent uh, the last portion of his life having married and father to child. Um, so I, I show this slide and, and read the words of his niece because we've highlighted James's youthful ambition and his clash with Major Long because they're central to his landmark botanical discoveries and to the first recorded ascent of Pikes Peak. But to be fair, we need to balance that 
with the fact that James went on to a long and distinguished career, as did, as did Major Long. In James's case, he went on to be a writer and editor, an ethnographer who studied Native American languages, and as an active abolitionist, as we see here. Both James and Long were strong personalities, and we visited just a couple of months in their entire lives by focusing on the Pikes Peak climb and the scientific work that James accomplished. But both men are more than the sum of these events. In closing, I'd also point out that Long's expedition in 1820 took place on the cusp of America's westward movement. In writing Long's official report, James suggested a law against slaughtering buffalo because he had learned that the buffalo sustained the indigenous plains peoples. When James approached the expedition, he had written in a letter to his brother that he would be taking a five years walk among pagans and savages. But by the time he'd met the Pawnee in person and spent three months on the high plains observing plains Indians and the buffalo they depended on, he advocated against the slaughter of the buffalo. So James had made a personal journey in three months that would teach him lessons of a lifetime. However, in 1820, on the cusp of the American westward movement, James's advice was ignored. What unfolded instead was the tragic confrontation between Anglos and Native Americans that constitute one of our nation's original sins. And until we reckon with it, we cannot call ourselves civilized. On that note, we'll close our story on Edward James's scientific adventure 200 years ago this summer.